I'm Nick Pettit. I'm Jason Seifer. And you're watching The Treehouse Show, your weekly dose of internets where we talk about all things web design, web development, and more. In this episode, we'll be talking about Flexbox, push notifications, responsive tables, and more. Let's check it out. First up, we have a small piece of JavaScript called TinySort. TinySort is a plugin that allows you to sort HTML elements by any text or attribute value. I know that because it says it on the web page right here at the top. Now, why in the world would this be useful? Well, let's say you have a bunch of different nodes. I'm going to just jump to the examples so we can see it here. Here is a list of list items, and we can sort that, and it will sort in alphabetical order by the first item in the list, the first character here. So you just initialize that by calling tiny sort and then give it a selector. Now there are a ton of different options for this. You can sort by different nodes inside here. So here we have a span with the same information. Hit sort and once again, it goes in alphabetical order. This also works on numbers as we can see right here. I'll just hit this little sort button and wow, these numbers are sorted right in the list. Now, this isn't limited to just list items. They show here, oh, hey, maybe I want to sort a table. Well, go ahead and do that. Wait, that was the wrong item. Let me, let me find the actual table here. Here we go, sorting tables. With just this little amount of code, you can get a sortable table using only one single plugin. So really easy to use. Just go ahead and initialize it on your page, then call tiny sort with the list of nodes. We'll have a link to this in the show notes, which you can get to right below this video. Very cool stuff. Well, next up is a really cool tool called Flexbox Playground. And you can adjust all sorts of different settings that basically determine which properties are going to be applied to this group of elements. Now, Flexbox is a little bit challenging to understand. And so that's why this tool is so great. It's basically an educational tool. You can use it to figure out what these different properties and values are going to do to each element in a Flexbox container. So first, you can adjust the width of each one of these children. So that's helpful. You can add children if you want to or delete them. And you can also adjust individual properties on each one of these child elements. But first, let's do the parent flex properties, the flex container properties. So I could change, for example, the flex direction. So right now it is row, so each element is right next to one another horizontally. But I could also do row reverse, and now they will be reversed. So you can see the ordering is right there, four, three, two, one, and we can go back. You can also do these in columns or column reverse. So you could do something like that. And with just this one value, you can change how all of these elements are laid out. So that sort of demonstrates some of the power of Flexbox right there. You can also justify the content by using the justify content property. And right now it's at flex start, but you can move it to the end of this container. And of course that will change based on the flex direction. So that's sort of neat to note there. You can also center these or you can space them evenly. So that's sort of neat as well. And then finally, I'll just show you how you can adjust some of the properties on the child elements. So for example, let's say we had number one or two here or something like that. And as I change that order value, I said, well, I want this to be one. Well, now one is at the end because it comes after zero here. So I could maybe change three to be like two or something like that. And now that will be at the end. So I think you get the idea. But anyway, this is a really wonderful tool to help, your, help you get familiar with how Flexbox works. Very nice. Next up, we have a very long tutorial on the HTML5 Rocks blog, and this is talking about push notifications on the open web. Now, if you are trying to do development and send push notifications in Chrome versions 42 and up, there is a new push notification API that you can use. Now, there are a lot of things that you need to do 
in order to start using this push API. And it starts by using service workers. Now, this is a really long article, so I'm just going to touch on some of the finer points of this. There are a lot of things that you need to check for when you are implementing a service worker and also implementing push notifications. Not all of the devices and browser versions that are out there support push notifications, especially uh, in Chrome. Again, this article is only uh, talking about Chrome, so you need to check a whole bunch of things. And they tell you to default to having enable push notifications off because the odds are pretty good that the browser is not going to support service workers and push notifications at this point. So here's a little flow chart saying, hey, is push supported? And do we already have a push subscription? If yes, then OK. We can enable these push notifications. If not, we don't need service workers working in the background and doing a whole bunch of stuff. So then they show you, OK, here is the code that we need to check all of those different things. And this is very thorough. It says, OK, uh, do we have all this supported? All right, let's go ahead and register a service worker. And then here is going to update the text saying, all right, we've got that subscribed. Now let's go ahead and disable the push notifications if the user doesn't want that. So the other interesting part of this is that you need to make a project on the Google Developer Console. This uses the Google Cloud Messaging API to handle sending push notifications. Once you do that, you get a project, and you also can see some little details about your API. So OK, you, go, you got all that, write a web app manifest, and then you need to actually let the user say, hey, I do want to subscribe to push messaging. Then finally, you can send a push message once you, once you have all that. And there's a nice little animated GIF here that shows you what your push notification might look like. So these are just the basics of sending push notifications. It gets to be a little bit more in-depth in the article, and there is certain browser support that you need to take into account. These push notifications are going to work on Google Chrome 42 and up on the desktop and on Android. Now, on the desktop, the notifications are only going to show up if Chrome is open, but on Android, notifications will always show up because the user is subscribed to a push messaging service. Anyway, for more information, check out the article in the show notes. It's definitely pretty interesting how involved that is and how thin the browser support is right now. So yeah. I almost feel like that's something that maybe you'd want to hold off on for a little while. You know what? You really want to do it? It depends on the app because Safari supports push notifications and they have their own separate API. And the reason it's so involved is because it requires a server side component to it. Right. So this is push notifications on the web on Android. Basically, if you want that push notification in the notification center to come down. Either way, very cool stuff. Uh, next up, we have a blog post on the Living Social blog about responsive tables in pure CSS. Now, there have been a lot of blog posts about this historically over the past five or so years where responsive design has been in existence because, det because tables notoriously don't look good on mobile devices. It's really hard to make a large table with a lot of data in it compressed down to a mobile device like this. So a lot of those solutions have involved JavaScript, but one of the requirements for Living Social is that they wanted to do this without using any kind of JavaScript because there are all sorts of plugins that do that, and they link to some of them there. And they also wanted to have localized text. So one suggestion that Chris Courier made was to store the text in style sheets, which isn't too bad, but also not doing that is nice because it keeps the content in the view. So it keeps it in the HTML where it belongs. And then they also didn't want to just adjust the font size to like eight pixels and just cram all the text into this tiny table. So what do you do? Well, they had this pretty clever solution and it involves the pseudo elements before and after. Now you can use these elements to match the first and last children of selected elements, but this is just typically used for adding aesthetic elements, so adding like an arrow on a tooltip or something like that. However, they use this technique instead to apply data labels. So in their HTML here, they have these attributes that they're calling a data label, and then they 
use these values here to sort of label each part of their table. And then in their CSS, they can use those before and after pseudo elements uh, to apply the content property. Now using the content property, they then plug in the value attribute and they grab that data label value. So that then gets plugged into the before and after pseudo elements. So where does that go? Well, it ends up in tables that look like this. You can have a table that goes across or on a mobile device, you can have something that ends up looking more like this. So you can have the label on the left side and then the data on the right side. So basically, this technique makes it really easy to shuffle around labels and data. And they have this whole example on CodePen. So you can head over to CodePen and check out how they laid out their HTML and how they did their CSS. And it's actually pretty tidy. There's not a whole lot of CSS here. But you can see right here how they use the before pseudo class to apply the content property and the data label value, just like that. Anyway, really cool stuff. So definitely be sure to check that one out. Yeah. That is all we have time for this week. I am at NickRP on Twitter. And, I'm at, and I am at Jay Cipher. For more information on anything we talked about, go ahead and check out the show notes right below this video. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next week.